Chief Judge Donna Stroud uh, of the North Carolina Court of Appeals. Uh, and am I correct, Judge Stroud? You are the senior member. You've you've got the longest service on the Court of Appeals. That is correct. Yeah, it's hard to believe, but yeah. <laughs> and you look so young. I will oh, say thank that. You. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I don't know. Uh, yeah, so uh, we, I've just obviously finished talking with uh, Judge Jackson, which I, I thought it was an interesting connection that the two of you had actually practiced law together and now serve yeah. on, the, on the Court of Appeals. But uh, you are the Republican candidate for your uh, to retain your seat on the, on the Court of Appeals. Uh, but before we get into your duties as, as a judge and the uh, campaign that you're running, uh, tell the listeners about, you know, who you are, your background, family. Okay. Thank you. And thanks for doing this forum. I appreciate it. Uh, yep. I am Donna Stroud, Chief Judge Court Appeals. And um, I was born and raised in Kentston, North Carolina. So Eastern North Carolina. And um, you know, my family, my father worked at DuPont, uh, which is a textile company um, and was in National Guard. Um, neither of my parents went to college um, initially. You know, when they got out of high school, they just went to work. Um, my mother was also at DuPont then. And um, although she later went back to school and became an elementary school teacher. So um, I decided in third grade I wanted to be an attorney. And I'm not sure why. I certainly yeah. did not have any in my family, had never met one. Um, was Perry I, Mason on TV? Yeah, everyone TV? asked if yeah. I, that's what I was watching. No, I think I like Star Trek better. <laughs> uh, but anyway, somehow I got that idea. And I think it might have been from... So my father worked shifts at DuPont. And so he would work at night a lot and then he would be sleeping during the day. And so sometimes he would go, he liked to go down and watch court and hang out at the courthouse and talk to people. He was really interested in those things. And so I must have heard him talking about it. That is the only place that I can think of that I would have even heard about it. And um, so I decided that in third grade and, and stuck with that idea right on through school, decided I wanted to go to Campbell Law School. Um, and it, because you, one of the what now you went to Campbell undergrad too didn't you right? yeah I went to, well yeah I decided I want to go to Campbell Law School first see I, yeah. I oh okay all right yeah uh -huh. so I went to Campbell undergrad uh because they had a a pre-law curriculum and I did the pre-law curriculum in government but uh you know I was um I had heard that North that Campbell was the best place to go if you wanted to be in a courtroom in North Carolina and is my sound doing okay yeah okay I heard good. a little bit of echo um yeah, yeah. And so I decided, uh, you know, to go to Campbell and I uh, went there. I uh, did that the undergrad in three years because I was in a hurry and it's cheaper that way. And uh, then went to Campbell uh, Law School, of course, loved it. I, I graduated first in my class. Um, and um, I don't know if you remember this, but actually I interviewed with you. I considered a clerkship on the Court of Appeals. And uh, that was when you were running. Uh, to become the first Republican elected to statewide judicial office in the state in about a hundred years. And, um, but I decided that I wanted to, instead of doing a clerkship, uh, get into a courtroom right away when I got out of law school. And so I took a job with a small uh, firm in Eastern Wake County. It was a general practice. Uh, we had up to uh, about 10 attorneys at the largest, which was considered reasonably large back in those days. Not now. And right. um, so we did a, a lot of different things. We represented some towns. Uh, we did all sorts of cases. So I got to do um, literally just about everything. I mean, from, you know, did personal injury, uh, did family law, did some criminal law. One of my law partners did some capital murder cases. So I assisted him in some of that. Um, we were the town attorneys for some towns, so I got to be the town attorney sometimes, you know, workers' comp. I actually had several clients who did petroleum hauling uh, and transport, so I did some cases before the Utilities Commission dealing with uh, those companies. Um, so a really huge variety of things, which it was a little bit stressful sometimes, uh, but also extremely good preparation for the Court of Appeals since we hear cases from all over the state and all types of different things. And toward the latter years, I tried to focus more on family law. I really enjoyed family law and so focused more on that. Um, then in 2004, uh, I ran for district court judge in Wake County. 
and was elected to that. So I served in district court as a, so I was a trial court judge at that point. Um, and the district court, here's of course a lot of different things and really enjoyed that. I also served as a family court judge there. So had a lot of family law cases when I was in uh, district court. And then in 2006, had the opportunity to run for the Court of Appeals, which, you know, a statewide race. I mean, you know, it's just very daunting. But anyway, I, I did. And yeah, uh, I have to ask you, I, I think 2006 was right about the time there was a transition to uh, unaffiliated races. Yeah, uh, it was. Uh, I think actually 2000, it was 2000. Well, I was, it was an nonpartisan when I ran in 2004 for district court. I know and it had just switched to district court. And then uh, it was, yeah, it was um, nonpartisan when I first ran in 2006 for the Court of Appeals. And, uh, and, uh, and I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but uh, is this your first partisan race? Yes. It, it, yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, your other, your other two elections were... The nonpartisan, nonpartisan right. races, mm-hmm. yeah. But we'll talk some about the difference mm-hmm. differences in, in in that. So, um, all right. So we we've talked with Judge Jackson uh, earlier about the role of the Court of Appeals as kind of the workhorse of the appellate system. Uh, but you've been there a long time. Uh, mm-hmm. Tell us about the changes you've seen and and uh, your takeaways from. Mm-hmm all of the, the years that you've served there. Sure. Yeah, we are. We have a pretty heavy caseload. Uh, we do, depending on the year, you know, filings go up and down, uh, but anywhere, say, you know, 1,200, 1,500 cases a year. There, there have been lower, there have been higher. Uh, of course, COVID uh, and the shutdowns of the trial courts from the pandemic caused sort of a dip in the filings because the, the cases aren't getting tried in the trial court. They're not getting to the court of appeals. As far as our procedure during a shutdown, we, we of course were doing just fine because most of our work is the oral arguments, which we were able to do of course, remotely uh, online with something like what we're on right now, as far as the video and uh, called WebEx. And um, you know, and of course we have briefs and records and we're doing lots of reading and research and writing. So we were able to proceed just fine. Uh, very different for the trial courts, which of course have to deal with so many people coming into the court. And um, so that, you know, really the, the, the changes from the pandemic have created the largest changes in the court that we've had probably ever in a, in a short period of time, just because, uh, you know, as you know, judges, justices are not necessarily the world's, you know, first adopters on technology and changing things and changing the way you work. Uh, judges tend to be very conservative in that manner. And um, we were, so we've had electronic filing for a long time, but of course moving to, uh, you know, do arguments on WebEx was certainly different. And we have kept that as an option available to people. So we, now we have our arguments, not just in person in the courtroom, but we also have the option available uh, to attorneys um you know, to do it online if they need to for just, they don't want to drive that far. And, you know, we recognize that North Carolina is a very long state. We definitely appreciate right. that right now when we're campaigning and, um, or for medical reasons or whatever. Uh, so we still have that as an option. And we've had to, uh, so we've had to update our processes internally because uh, of course we were very paper-based internally into how we circulated cases, how we dealt with the chambers uh, as we, are working on our cases. And so we've had to go to a, an electronic model to do that. And we've been trying to improve that. Cause of course, like everyone else, we had to switch very suddenly in March of 2020, just to like, we're all going to email each other. That gets very confusing. So we've had to uh, work that out. Um, now I do, I do uh, want to point out not mm-hmm. all cases at the court of appeals have oral argument. In other words, uh, some cases mm-hmm. are decided simply on the briefs. How, how does that work? Well, That's right. How do, how do you decide that? Yeah, we hear about, I think, 15, 20 percent of our cases are orally argued. And the way we decide that is that the panel, so a, a panel of three judges, here's each case. And so the cases are assigned to the panel. And um, we review those cases as we're getting ready for court. And then the panel decides if they would like to have oral argument, if they think that would be useful in the particular case. The, the 
parties can also request oral argument. And we certainly consider that if, if they have requested argument. Sometimes, though, we might want argument in a case that the parties haven't requested oral argument because there's something that we'd like to ask about or find out about. So uh, you have been the chief judge now since January 2021. That's correct. And mm -hmm. the chief justice of the Supreme Court has the authority to appoint a mm -hmm. chief judge. Uh, it has historically gone to the uh, the judge mm -hmm. with the greatest seniority at the Court of Appeals. But you also, I believe, are the first Republican in the history of the Court of Appeals to serve as chief judge when Chief Justice Newby appointed you. So um, I, that significance is good for the history books. Beyond that, I'm not sure what the benefit is, but yeah. you are a first, right? Yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, so as a chief judge, what, what duties do you have over and above mm -hmm. the normal duties of the other judges? Okay. We, as a chief judge, of course, we do the same thing as far as deciding cases and writing opinions and all that as all the other judges because uh, we all, of course, function independently that way. Uh, sometimes, you know, we, we don't get to tell other judges how to vote. You know, sometimes people are like, hey, how come you let them do that? You know, we certainly don't have any control over other judges, nor should we. Um, so the additional duties are basically administrative things, uh, such as, um, you know, dealing with setting up calendars, dealing with uh, issues regarding uh, personnel and uh, the building, um, you know, all sorts of, of things that, you know, kind of come up in, in running, a, you know, an office that has, and we have, you know, almost 100 people, uh, you know, working for the Court of Appeals, including all the judges and clerks and the clerk's office and the uh, staff counsel's office and all the different people here. Um, you know, we deal with things like uh, helping to organize and set up the continuing education for our, we have law clerks that we have, to, we provide the continuing legal education for, uh, we do some continuing judicial education for our court each year. Um, so basically those sort of administrative type things uh, is what, what I deal with as chief. Yeah. Well, uh, and I would note that normally uh, the oral arguments are held uh, at the Court of Appeals building in Raleigh, but Court of Appeals historically has traveled mm -hmm. some, sending panels to other parts of the state. COVID obviously put a uh, uh, put the skids on that, but uh, do you anticipate having uh, panels out and about the state, which gives the public a greater yeah. opportunity? Yeah. yeah, we are working on uh, some of that. Well, we go to the law schools pretty much every year, and then also we will ha do some sessions in different parts of the state occasionally. Um, and actually, we're hoping to do one. I know we were hopefully we have one in the works for Western North Carolina um, in, you know, it'll probably be in 23, maybe spring. I'm not sure. But uh, that's something that we're hoping to do because we yeah, we haven't gotten to go and do that. Uh, any of those trips further away to courthouses um, since before the pandemic, we have resumed our sessions at law schools. I think we actually have one coming up at the Duke's Law School on October 18th. Uh, and so we have we have been re doing those already. Um, oh, and one other thing I, I just wanted to mention, you know, while we're talking about sort of changes from uh, the pandemic, we all of our oral arguments are now streamed live on YouTube and they're all recorded and all available. So if anyone wants to see what an oral argument at the Court of Appeals looks like, uh, they are on YouTube. Uh, so the, uh, uh, the campaign, I want to, want to transition over to, uh, the campaign. Your, uh, judges are elected under the constitution for eight year terms. Uh, your term expires at the end of this year. Um, and you had for the first time, I believe, uh, a primary opponent. That's right. And uh, it, you know, I, it, this is a question I have to ask. The, the, what I gathered was that there were some who felt that you weren't partisan enough uh, in your duties as chief judge. 
and therefore uh, a candidate was uh, was run against you in the primary, uh, someone who I might note you handily defeated in the primary. But was I mean, did that? How did how did you respond or feel about uh, about that and about perceptions that somehow you weren't partisan enough? Right. Well, every election is very different, as you know. Uh, I actually have had two primaries before in nonpartisan elections. I had one in Wake County when I ran for district court judge, and I had one in 2006 when I ran for court of appeals. They were nonpartisan primaries. Um, and then, of course, I was very blessed to be able to run unopposed in 2014. Um, so, yeah, I, but I had a, really a first in a lot of ways because I got to thinking about it and um you know, because I'm, I'm serving as chief judge, of course, I'm not elected as chief judge um, because the, the chief justice appoints this position. But um, I think I'm the first chief judge in uh, maybe ever, but certainly in memory, 20, 30 years to, you know, have had a, a, a primary um, in the reelection. Most of our chief judges have ended up being unopposed when they ran. Um, but, you know, but that's OK. And um but as far as, yeah, you know, the uh, I guess the perception that I was not partisan enough or whatever, I never really understood that. Uh, I'm not really sure. Um, I mean, obviously, my work on the court, I've written almost 1300 opinions, which are all out there for people to read. Um, you know, I could say whatever I want to about my work, but, you know, that doesn't mean a whole lot. Obviously, I would just hope people would look at my actual work to determine, uh, you know, if that is good or, or, or whatever, uh, you know, the thing is at the Court of Appeals, we have to rule in accord with the law as it has been set out by the General Assembly, as it's been set out by the North Carolina Supreme Court or the United States Supreme Court, depending upon the case. And, and that's certainly what I try to do in every single case. And I, I just try to consider each one fairly and thoroughly to write an opinion that's going to be clear, that's going to, um, you know, explain things for the parties and the public and the trial judges. Uh, you know, that's my goal in every case. And so the, um, you know, elections, you know, every one is so different. Things change so much in eight years. Obviously, yeah. the political world changes dramatically in eight years. So they're all very different. Um, but, uh, you know, has it been more difficult or or easier to run in a partisan, in in an overt partisan right. race versus the quote uh, nonpartisan race, which always had elements of partisanship. Sure, yeah. some of both. Uh, parts are easier, parts are harder. I'd say, um, yeah, the parties have always been involved in the case, in the elections, even when they were nonpartisan. I always told people that. You know, I mean, every every judge who's been elected statewide in North Carolina has run as either a Republican or Democrat. We've never had anyone who was unaffiliated or any other party run. And just because of the way our system is set up, that's pretty much how you have to do it. Uh, the parties have always been involved when when they were nonpartisan. The parties were involved in trying to let everyone know these are the Republicans. These are the Democrats. So the parties probably had to work a little harder perhaps on that because it wasn't on the ballot. So they had to try to let people know, because of course a lot of people know so very little about judicial candidates when they just see names and they don't know any party and they don't know who they are. They don't vote. We have a lot of drop off. So both of the parties would work really hard to try to let the voters know who was who voters want to know that they ask. I mean, you know, that, that's their first question when you're running in a nonpartisan race, it's a reasonable question. Uh, and, you know, so that information is there. Um, you know, obviously with the primary, a party primary is a difficult thing. Uh, you know, that part is difficult. Um, but as far as the rest of it, you know, the, just like, you know, I like said they were when they were nonpartisan, they are now. Both parties, Republican, Democrat, are both involved in trying to educate voters and let them know who their candidates are. So uh, my perception is that the Republican Party in this election cycle put together a slate very early on. They've sort of labeled it as the conservative slate. Um, how, how do you fit into that? I mean, how, how, you know, 
I was on that. Uh, yeah, you were on that, right. how I fit in. Um, yeah. You know, which made the primary more interesting. But uh, anyway, well, you know, we, as you probably, you know, you certainly know from your time in the courts, you know, people, uh, obviously, you know, I was up for re-election. So, you know, I'm pretty obvious as far as, you know, who's going to be running for my seat. Um, and then, and then there's people who, um, you know, who are planning to run and, and you just kind of have to figure out, you know, what is the right year? What are the right circumstances? A lot goes into that for a person's life, literally, you know, they're, it may have family obligations or whatever that you kind of have to find the right moment to do that. So, um, you know, so I think it's just kind of a process of, of people who, um, you know, identify themselves or are identified that are, you know, uh, interested in running and, and in a particular year, uh, there's the opportunity and, and sort of it comes together that way. You know, the, the public has concerns and there's a lot of media attention, more so at the Supreme Court level, both state and nationally, uh, about the judiciary being partisan. Mm -hmm. that votes split along partisan lines. Uh, talk a little bit about the challenge of mm -hmm. trying to do a nonpartisan job with colleagues of, you know, like Judge Jackson, who you've known obviously a long time, but who's a Democrat and who's on the Democrat ticket, mm -hmm. um, and having to go out and campaign in a partisan election in order to secure enough votes to right. be elected. As far as our work at the court, uh, I'm, I'm very happy to be able to say that our court has a long history of being a very collegial court, that we, we generally get along very well in our work, you know, when we work on cases together. And of course, the vast, vast, vast majority of cases don't really have any sort of element that people would even think of as partisan. Uh, you know, I, I don't, you know, if you're classifying marital property in an equitable distribution case, mm -hmm. I don't think there is a liberal or a conservative view of that. You just simply look at the law and you apply it to the facts in the case. And so we have so many cases that that is not an issue. Obviously, you do have some issues that, that come up that people do think of uh, as those more partisan issues. But um, and we disagree on those sometimes. And, you know, but that's you know, that's just how it is. That is the nature of this job. Um, if you're a judge and you're going to exercise independent judgment, sometimes you're going to disagree with other judges. And of course, we can write a dissent if we disagree with the, um, the other two judges on a panel. Um, but we, we generally work. It, it's not as difficult as people might think. Uh, you know, things out in the public sometimes are so, you know, people are arguing about issues and fighting about issues. But this is this is what judges do. This is what lawyers do. We argue different sides of issues uh, and we look at all of that objectively and, and try to make a determination of what the law says. And so it's really not, um, you know, it's really not been a problem uh, on the court. Uh, we, we work together well. And from a campaign standpoint, because mm -hmm. uh, I mean, Everybody just simply understands if you're going to run, you got to run. Yeah. You know, and you got to run with your ticket or your team. Yeah. It's part of the job. I mean, if you're going to get elected, it, it, you have to, you have to uh, you know, go through a campaign and election. And, and we all know that. That's how it works. Yeah. Uh, well, are there any issues? And candidly, I got to say, in all my years of being involved one way or another, I can't remember any hot court of appeals mm -hmm. issues that were driving the campaigns uh, or the elections, but anything out there that, uh, that, that you're hearing or that voters need to know about you in particular or about your, your campaign, mm -hmm. your endorsements? Well, I think that, you know, there's no particular issues, obviously, with the, with the court of appeals, I don't think, but the important thing I believe is that, you know, we have judges who, have the experience, uh, who can judge cases fairly, who have integrity, uh, who recognize uh, judicial independence, you know, how important it is for our courts to be independent, uh, you know, to make those decisions. Um, and that's certainly what, you know, I've been trying to do uh, for my almost 16 years on the court. Um, I have, you know, I am pleased that I have endorsements that are really bipartisan. 
Um, I'm endorsed by the, uh, the Association of Defense Attorneys, uh, which is sort of one side of the, the courtroom when you're uh, you know, in cases, and also by the Advocates for Justice, the plaintiff's attorneys. Uh, so I'm endorsed by both of those groups of attorneys. They do interviews. They look at our cases. They look at our work. So, um, you know, I'm very pleased to have both of their endorsements. Um, I'm endorsed by the Sierra Club. Um, you know, I'm endorsed by um, several former uh, Republican Supreme Court justices. I'm also endorsed by our former chief judges um, of this court, um, the two that I served with, Chief Judge uh, Martin and uh, Chief Judge Linda McGee. Uh, you know, I have contributions from Republicans. I have contributions from Democrats. So um, I think that the, the bipartisan support is important for a court that we, we do want our courts to be nonpartisan, obviously, in how we're ruling. And uh, that is uh, what I have tried to do throughout my career on the bench and um, would like to continue to do. But, you know, and, and like I said, I, the experience, the cases are there, uh, you know, Whatever I say is, you know, is what I say. But, you know, I'd say judge me on the work that I've done. Yeah. Well, I forgot to ask Judge Jackson this, but do uh, you have a website you want to I do. direct uh, folks sure. to? Yeah. Uh, JudgeStroud.com uh, is the website. And, of course, there's the Facebook and all the other social media stuff that you can uh, find as well. Well, uh, Chief Judge Donna Stroud of the North Carolina Court of Appeals. Uh, former senior partner who hired Judge Jackson was was that a good hire? I uh, wanted to ask you that. In <laughs> he did a really good job. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, we wish you the best of luck uh, in the rest of the campaign, and thank you for your service uh, to the state over all these years. And we'll look forward to talking again. All right. Thank you. <laughs>